to share a little bit on on honor and how to um, basically build a culture of honor and how the the importance of this and I want to start first of all with maybe just a little bit of a testimony of my own journey and and um, where this my journey with honor actually started so um, I grew up Amish and married my wife Sevilla in 1995 and a few years later, in, 19, in 99, at age 25, I was converted. My initial response was, uh, when I got converted, was to become more Amish and more dedicated to the Amish church. I loved my Amish lifestyle and culture and believed if, any, if anyone had it right, it was the Amish. However, as time passed, I began to notice some inconsistencies within the Amish church, and which concerned me, and being, you know, a rather outspoken person. I was not afraid to voice my concerns and soon discovered that my questions were actually not welcome, which actually just raised more questions. This uh, ended up in some, or um, yeah, resulted in some tense conversations with, um, with my father and the rest of my family. And I believe it was around, like, uh, around 2004 uh, for Father's Day. I was at a local grocery store I was looking for a Father's Day card for my dad, and <clears throat> that was while we were still Amish. Would have been, yeah, about five years I was after I was converted. And I was just standing there trying to decide which card to buy. This rush of emotions kind of comes over me, uh, which kind of becomes a combination of uh, love and appreciation for my father and also guilt for not honoring him the way I should have. And while my conversion was genuine and, and, and some of my concerns were valid, my approach was very proud and arrogant, and I was not showing honor where honor was due. And I purposed at that moment that I was going to figure out this thing of honor and what it meant and how that looked for me to honor my father. Um, one of the things that I did is I decided that in spite of the contention that was between us around theology and church and those kind of things, there was areas in my life where I needed my father's wisdom and input, and I chose to ask him first wherever I, you know, I had questions, just general life uh, questions that I needed some answers for. And um, anyway, I, I I decided not to. We I wasn't going to touch the uh, the subject of um, of church and theology and those things. There was just contention there, and I I I needed to kind of avoid those things. Going back to my childhood, during my childhood, my relationship with my father was somewhat rough, um, actually kind of culminated in an all-out hair-pulling fight in my early teens, and um, I think something kind of changed after that. I think both of us kind of purposed from that day forward that that wasn't going to happen again, even though we actually never talked about it. Um, in April of 2006, we were finally excommunicated from the Amish church after seven years of trying to make it work. And at that time, I saw something in my father I didn't know existed, at least not to that extent, a deep compassion for mistreated and misunder, uh, misunderstood people. And mom and dad walked alongside of us in that whole process very closely. And I, I actually gained a relationship with my father then that I had never really experienced before. Um, and though they really hoped that we could stay Amish, they were actually very understanding and they, they genuinely tried to understand us and hear us and um, were willing to hear what our concerns and our struggles were. That relationship continued to grow, um, though not without ups and downs till my dad died of cancer in um, December of 2019, which about 13 years later. Um, and about a month before he died, he was in Mexico for treatments and needed, needed to come home, but was not well enough to travel by land. So I flew down and had the opportunity to take mom and dad on their first plane, first airplane ride. Amish uh, typically are not supposed to fly, but sometimes in emergencies like that, it's, there's some exceptions made. Dad thoroughly enjoyed that ride. And um, anyway, for the next couple of weeks, uh, until he passed, 
I spent um, a couple hours almost every other day with him, just reading scriptures, praying, talking about the past and, and talking about the future and, and um, uh, things like that. Really had some really, really special times with my dad in those, those last two weeks. And it was um, during that time that he said that us leaving the Amish was one of the best things that ever happened in his life. And he also, during that time, wrote a letter, or he had somebody else write it for him. He wasn't able to write himself anymore, but he had my sister write it for him, uh, that he wanted to make sure that all of his descendants get a copy of. And the co content of the letter was uh, basically an encouragement to be faithful uh, in our commitment to Christ, and then an admonition for the rest of the family and to receive us, and my brother Henry, who also is not Amish, and um, as a part of the family and not be so so harsh in their in their shunning us and whatever. So anyway, that was kind of the story of my my journey with uh, my my father, and um, you know this, which is kind of where this whole study, this search of uh, of uh, what it means to honor, kind of started out with was in my relationship with my father. Now, uh, let's go to the scriptures, um, you know, Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3, of course, is where we see the scriptures where it talks about honoring father and mother, as children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, honor your father and mother, and it says, this is the first commandment with promise, that it may be good with, it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Um now, what, what does it mean by the first commandment with promise? Well, if you go back to the Ten Commandments, this is, a, this is basically a quote from the Ten Commandments. It's from the Fifth Commandment. It's the first commandment that has a promise attached to it in reference to the Ten, Ten Commandments. All of the commandments before that are just, you know, uh, do this and don't do this and whatever. But this, this one, then there is a promise connected to it. And that's what he's talking about here. Um. Of course, uh, Exodus 20, verse 12, this is how it reads in the, uh, in the Ten Commandments. In, 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 and again, I'm reading out of the ESV here. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that, that the Lord your God is giving you. Um, this is also one of the uh, two, only two of the Ten Commandments that actually are pro positive. In other words, it says what tells us what we should do rather than what we should not do. All the rest of the commandments um, tell us what we should do. And there's uh, this one, and then there is one other one. It's, um, um, I, th I think it's, um, forget which one it is, but anyway, it's um, um, keeping the Sabbath. So these two are the only ones that have actually have a positive message. All the others are, are negative, things that you should not do. And so when we look at this commandment, uh, and that it may live, that you may live long in the land. Um, oftentimes in the relation to, to the commandments and promises of God, we, we tend to look at things in a somewhat mystical way where, you know, let's say, for example, uh, tithing is a good example that's often used in that way. So you, you give and you will receive. And it's kind of just this mystical thing that you don't know how this works or whatever, but you, somehow when you do the right things, then magically God makes good things happen to you. Where, as I look at this commandment, it, it, it feels to me like maybe this is actually a little bit more practical than that. Um, and actually, there's, there's a very logical connection in uh, the commandment and the promise. And the connection is that when you think about a society or community that will not honor its older generation, it will, by default, it will become very unstable. Um, it's also logical, you know, if you want to know how to live long, you ask advice from those who have lived long. So who is that? Well, the older generation. And so it has a very practical application, um, you know, where it, it, it seems to me like, uh, you know, the older generation tends to be a little bit more conservative, a little bit less prone, prone to change. They're a little bit more stable. Uh, they kind of bring a little bit of a stable core to any kind of community or a church or whatever it might be, the younger generation, they're adventurous, they're, they're, um, um, you know, risk takers and whatever. And, and so they tend to be a little bit more unstable and, and they need the older generation. We need both. 
In fact, I think it's very important that also for the older generation to understand the need for the, under, the younger generation to, to have a place where they can take risks, where they can uh, have some adventure, where they're, they're the pioneers kind of reaching out and, and going into the next, the next field and the next um, um, mission or whatever it might be. Too many times the the there's a there's a gap that happens between the generations and that connection is broken between the uh, uh, the older generation and the the younger generation, and um, uh, I think that's a real detriment to society when that happens. Um, we we need each other, but it's also maybe a little bit like um, you know you think about the old walled cities or or even in, in the early american days you know you had people living in forts and then their farms were kind of out around that so uh, any kind of community needs that strong core that that safe place or that uh, stable place that where where the you know it's safe for families to grow up in it's it's there's not a lot of things changing all the time and and but then you need to have a place where uh the younger generation the adventurers they can go out and they can conquer more territory or whatever it might be you know the the in those times the farms were usually outside the fort around them and then sort of during the day they would go out to their farms and you know at nighttime they had the safe place of the fort to to enter to protect from uh from indians or other enemies whatever um <clears throat> one of the example of of that in the old testament of uh, uh is in first kings 12 and this is just an example of um, uh, a king, Rehoboam, who rose up and, and he first asked the older generation for advice and they gave him some really good advice. And if he would have followed that advice, the kingdom would probably held together. But then again, God had other purposes and that's why he raised up Rehoboam in that way. But Rehoboam disregards the counsel of the old man and listens to his own peers. And it's because of this that the kingdom was then divided. Few other verses that re relate to um, uh, this issue of honoring our father and mother specifically. Proverbs twenty verse twenty is if if one curses his father or mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. I think there's another place where it says that his eyes will be plucked out by the eagles, and so maybe that's um, um, how his lamp will be put out. But anyway, Proverbs 1, verse 8 to 9 says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. And then Proverbs 6, verse 20 to 23. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. So you see the contrast there. The one who will not honor his father and his mother, his light is put out. And then when you see the one where he keeps his father's commandment and forsakes not his mother's teaching, it says the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproofs of discipline are a way of life. So you have there that contrast where you know, this becomes a light for your path, a way to see the future um, through the eyes of um, the older generation. They have lived much longer than, than the young generation. And, and um, you know, the, we, we need that input from uh, the older generations, things that they have seen that we, we haven't. And so in that way, you know, that becomes like a lamp to our feet and a light to guide us. There's also in this, in relation to honor, there's um, uh, many other places where it talks about honor. I'm just going to touch a little bit on this, where um, uh, Romans 12, this is about honoring one another. Romans 12, verse 9 to 10 says that love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. And then it says outdo one another, ensuring honor. So there's a, there's a, um, a good competition that you can have there for um, you young people. You know, if you want, you like competition, there it is to outdo one another in showing honor. Then first Peter two verse 17 says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. 
uh, again, you know, just giving honor where where honor is due, talking there specifically about honoring the emperor, I think is also very important for us um, as a society that that can be a challenge uh, for myself even, you know, when um, we have presidents and things like that, that that do things that you don't approve of and you think is, I think we need to be very careful how we speak um, of those things. Also talks about husbands honoring their wives, First Peter 3, 7. Likewise, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vet, vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, um, honestly, the, um, the, the, the word used here is actually slightly different. Um, it has more of the idea of um, something that's valuable or precious. It's also, some places that particular word is also some places translated as price, and that's here where it talks about husbands honoring their wives. Also talks about honoring elders. First Timothy five verse seventeen and eighteen says, "Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching." For the Scripture says, "You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain." And the laborer deserves his wages. So there's more specifically talking about honoring in material goods, giving, um, sharing with your elders. And, and um, you know, the young generation, again, they're, they're strong. They have the ability to work hard. And, and uh, um, it's important for them to be able to, to share some of their gain with the older generation. Then also Leviticus uh, 19, verse 32, this is talking more of an older man. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. So, um, yeah, I was I was uh, struck by that verse. Um, uh, what was it, about a month ago or something like that? We were in India, and their honor is a very important thing. And... Um, like when we were coming out, come out after a meeting or sometime when they were just kind of lounging outside and there was no seat available, immediately somebody else would stand up and give me the place to, to, to sit. And, and at one time I said, well, you know, I don't, I don't need that. You can stay seated. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay standing. And, and uh, so I did that a few times. And at one point um, uh, a brother from there came up to you and says, brother, this is our culture. You need to take that seat. We want to honor you. And anyway, so I just, uh, when I came across that verse, I thought about that incident. Like, yeah, that's interesting. They actually have uh, that sense of honor in that culture in that way. It just felt very, uh, it didn't feel right for them to stay seated when I was standing. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm going to go into some of the definitions of words here. Um, How's our time looking? But anyway, uh, obey, going back to Ephesians 6, 6 um, obey versus honor. So obey is, um, has the idea of um, to hear as a subordinate, that is to listen attentively by implications to heed or conform to a command or authority, hearken to, to be obedient. So it basically is the idea of, of uh, of obeying, and I think it's important when we look at Ephesians six that we understand the difference there. It says, um, uh, "How does it say? Obey your father and mother in the Lord." And then it says, um, "No, children obey your parents in the Lord." And then it says, "Honor your father and mother." And there's Lord a sort of a qualifier there in obeying, but not in honor. So obey is not unconditional or or um, unquestioning obedience it is not saying that um, you know if you're if you um, your parents ask you to steal something or do something that's wrong that uh, you should obey but it says in the Lord but when it comes to honor it does actually doesn't give that qualifier at all honor is, is something that's totally different you can show honor even in times when you feel a need to maybe go a different direction than you, your parents would wish you to go. And that was kind of where the whole journey started for myself in trying to understand how I should honor my parents, even when there was disagreements. I love the definition of the Hebrew word honor. 
um, kabad or however that is pronounced. Anyway, it actually it literally means to be heavy or to make weighty. Um, that is a to be to um, uh, let me see here a primitive root to be heavy. That is in a bad sense burdensome, severe, dull, and in a good sense numerous, rich, honorable, causative to make weighty. And so I find that very interesting. Um, like, um, you know, we use those kind of phrases, like let's say, for example, you would say uh, about somebody that his words carry a lot of weight. Or maybe you would say he carries a lot of weight. Or maybe in a negative sense, you might say something like he likes to throw his weight around. Um, or those are weighty words. And so, yeah, I just really love that picture where, you know, my parents, th th their words have a lot of weight. They, they you know, I, I, I give a lot of weight to, to what they have to say. Um, and also when it, when you think about it in that way, it also, it, it also gives the sense that, you know, maybe there's something that actually has more weight. And what would that be? Well, how about uh, God's word or God's order? And I think we need to be very careful with this. I see this used very carelessly, you know, where, you know, people just, you know, kind of flippantly say that when, you know, I need to obey, obey God rather than man, but they're actually using it as sort of an excuse to, in some way, dishonor their parents. And uh, I think we need to be very careful with that, how we use that to, to, these are things that you know we we have to wrestle through um, each individual person and trying to understand you know what does it mean in your context what it, what does it mean to honor your parents and to really search deeply in your own heart to understand what it what it is that um, or what is your real heart motive I could say the Greek definition that's used in the Hebrew in the uh, in the New Testament isn't isn't quite as, um, doesn't use quite that um, uh, same kind of definition. It's more the idea of revere or value or something like that. But anyway, I love that Hebrew definition of something that uh, you make it weighty. Now, I want to go, when I look at a little bit of some things here concerning, so what do we do? How do we deal with uh, the sins of our fathers? And how do we how do we um, correct these things and at the same time show honor? Um, I want to go to Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 11. Here's a couple of really good examples of uh, Old Testament prophets, saints, that um, um, is a good example of this. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3 to 11 is Nehemiah's prayer. Um, it says, and they said to me, the remnant there in, prov in, province, in the province who have survived the exile is, a, is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Uh, so here, Nehemiah hears news from Jerusalem. And, you know, he's in exile and he hears news from Jerusalem that uh, thing, there's great trouble there and the walls are broken down. and and um, um, then num verse four is his response. And as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and ha have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Mo Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. 
They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was the king's cupbearer. So Nehemiah, he's the king's cupbearer. He's there before the king and, and uh, he hears this news and, and his initial response, I think, is important there in verse four. He sat down and wept and mourned for days and continued fasting and praying. <clears throat> so he he didn't just go swinging and, and start, you know, um, criticizing or whatever. But his first response was to, to pray and weep and mourn and fast um, for, for the situation. He was burdened by it. And um, then verse five, I like how he, he uses, this is something that you'll see in many places, uh, reminding God and himself of God's faithfulness in keeping covenants um, there in verse five. And, and I said, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandment. This is something that you notice throughout the scripture is um, uh where the prophets and, and um, many of the people of the Old, Old Testament, they will, in their prayers, they will remind God uh, of his covenant-keeping nature and how he never breaks his promises or his covenants. And um, so then I, I think it's part, partly reminding God, but also reminding themselves that uh, God is a covenant-keeping God. And then also... Verse six, uh, he talks about confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. So one thing that's interesting about here in, in Nehemiah's prayer is that he takes ownership for the sin of his fathers. Now, I don't know how old Nehemiah was. Um, you know, I'm assuming he was probably a pretty young man when he when um, they were exiled and he was sent off to Babylon. But. Nehemiah, so, so Nehemiah could have just washed his hands and say, well, this is not my fault. Uh, you know, this was, um, um, you know, the kings before us that um, did all these wicked things. And this is why we were, we were exiled. And we're, that's what, why we're in such great trouble and all these things. And, but no, Nehemiah doesn't do that. He actually takes it upon himself and he takes ownership of the sins of his fathers. He says, um, um, confesses the sins of the people of Israel and he says which we have sinned against you even I and my father's house have sinned we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and then um, he remembers God's word to his, to, to his fathers uh, verse 8 remember the word that you commanded to your servant Moses then he, then he quotes the promise there in his prayer if you are faithful, I will scatter you among the people. And if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. And so um, there again, he's kind of referring to a promise that God had made back in the time of Moses. And he's saying, reminding God that he, this is his word to them. And Nehemiah is wanting to, to take the lead in turning their hearts back to the Father so that they would be returned to their own land. And then verse uh, 10 and 11, um, re remembering that we are just servants and he's requesting success in the services that he's, he's uh, wanting to perform there. And um, then also another one, another place, uh, Similar to that is in Daniel chapter 9, verse 3 to 6. And very similar wording there. It says, uh, here was Daniel remembering that it was 70 years, and that was the promise that they would be exiled for 70, 70 years. And Daniel was realizing that the time is coming up. And 
he turns to the Lord in prayer and it says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And yes, you see some of the same responses there as with Nehemiah. He, uh, he, he fasting and um, praying. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep, command, keep his commandments. So very similar. He's again, he's reminding God of his covenant. And the promise that he had made, you know, even all the way back to Abraham. But then verse 5, he again, just like Nehemiah, he takes ownership of the sin. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Now, Daniel, we know, was a very young man when he was exiled. And... Again, he could have said that that was not my fault. I had nothing to do with that. And that was uh, um, the kings before me. And But that's not what he did. He took ownership of the sins of his fathers. And he, um, and as far as Daniel is concerned, um, yeah, it may very well be. It says, says Daniel and his friends there, they were actually um, of royal seed. So it's a possibility that Daniel's, father may have been one of the kings possibly even king josiah if you look at the the, the dates there or at least it was of royal lineage now let's um i'm i'm, I'm let's go to um another section here and we're going to talk a little bit about um you know what is the right response how do we respond in a situation where um we see some sins of our fathers and there's a, a, very, a story that I love in relation to this, and this is, uh, this is in Genesis, uh, the story of the flood. Um, there's a lot of things that we could get out of this. One thing I want to, I talked a little bit in the, uh, before about um, uh, the structure of society and the importance of having something stable at the center. And um, um, I would say, you know, that structure is maybe the traditions and the things that we that we do, um, maybe even like holidays and, and just how we do things is is a part of a stru structure of a of a normal society. All of us have some sort of traditions. We have we have standard ways of of doing things. Things are the right way and things are the wrong way. And and sometimes sometimes traditions are are good and sometimes they're bad. You know, there's there's things that we have traditions in our culture that you know, are not good. And there's some things that need to be changed. But uh, the tendency often is for us to just want to tear the whole structure down and start from the bottom and, and rebuild it, you know, when especially if, for some people that are hurt by it and um, uh, maybe are reacting. One of the things that I, I, I see there in the story of the flood is uh, even in the ark itself, it, it it's sort of like a representation of that structure that in a very real way, saves us. Uh, not saving us in the sense of, uh, uh, that's not a salvation, like in a sense of saving us from eter eternal damnation, but it, it keeps us in, in the uh, society or the culture, the community that we live. There's, there's, there's safety in that stability, in, in that structure that we have that uh, brings a sense of purpose, it brings a sense of, of stability, in a sense of um, um, where things are not constantly changing, and we 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 know what to expect, and we're not uh, on edge all the time. There's a there's a place for for our for our families for us to raise our families that is safe, and um, um, we're not faced with constant change and 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 pressure. Oftentimes, we don't appreciate the structures because we don't fully understand what we're saved from. We're here in America, and you know you can look at it in a, in a multiple ways. Uh, you know, one way uh, on a bigger scale would be you see the structure of society in America in, in general. You have uh, laws, you have uh, uh, police officers that that um, uh, enforce the laws. You have uh, national guard. You have all those kind of things in place, which is all part of the uh, the national structure that we have that that keeps us safe, and. Um, so we're so used to that for so long to just have things the way we expect it that we don't even really know what we've been saved from. 
you know, until you go to other countries, maybe sometimes, and you see where things, you know, war torn countries and whatever, where things have been, have, where societies have unraveled. Then structure is important, especially for families. And, um, yeah, like I said, there's a, there's a temptation for us when we see a problem with the structure is to tear the whole thing down. And we're actually in here in America, if you look at it, look at the society around us, you know, we're about six years into such an experience here in secular America. And, uh, you know, honestly, it's not turning out very well. You know, you had the, um, um, the um, rise of the hippie movement in the sixties and the seventies and, and uh, just anti-culture and, and, and against, the older generation, a young generation that was rising up and just wanted to tear the whole place apart and riots and things like that. And now we're, we're um, seeing the results of about 60 years of that. And it's not turning out very well if you look around us and you see what's happening to society here. What's interesting also is the prevailing spirits that are in the world always have a subtle way of slipping into the church. And so you, you end up seeing some of those things in the church as well where there's a generation before us that made some mistakes, but honestly also uh, made some pretty drastic moves to kind of correct some of the, the errors from the hippie movement, maybe even. And so in my early Christian life, some of those influence were, influencers were men like uh, Michael Pearl and Bill Gothard and Denny Keniston and others. They were all fallible men with flaws, some of them pretty serious, both in their personal lives and in things that they taught. Um, however, in a very real way, you know, I stand in the shoulders of men like that. And we need to be very, we need to be honest with uh, some of their flaws, but also we need to be careful to, and even understand a little bit where they're coming from. You know, they're, they're coming out of the hippie movement, many of these men, and, um, just seeing the unraveling of society and pushing about pushing back against you know unspeakable odds against the society that was going the wrong direction and um, in their zeal and their desire to to make some change they made some mistakes um, but also you know recognize some of the things that uh, that we have today um, might not be possible without them and now you see within the church, there's a generation rising up that wants to cancel those very men and remove their books and messages from the libraries. And I, I'm, I, I think we need to be very careful with that. It's, it's um, uh, like I said, yes, maybe there's some things that need to be kind of reevaluated, but um, um, let's not cancel the whole thing. We have, we have learned a lot from, from men like that, or at least I have. Um. In Genesis, back to uh, the story of the flood, Genesis 9, verse 18 to 27. Um, the sons of Noah went forth from the ark. Who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. And these three were the sons of Noah, and from these the, the, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and, be plant, and he planted a vineyard. He drank the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on both, it, both their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces turned backwards and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger sons had done, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he, shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. This is um, a really good example of the proper way to respond to a father's faults, his nakedness, his vulnerabilities, you could say. Um, and... Um, Ham represents the wrong way of responding, of course. Rather than doing something about it, he actually went out and told others about it. And this is something that I think is, is um, something that we can be very careful. I, I've, I've done this many, many times myself, uh, you know, where you're sitting in a group of people that are struggling with the, the system that grow, grew up with, whether it's Amish or Mennonite or anything else. And 
you know, kind of picking it apart and, and, you know, look what they just did now. And, and you can't, I can't believe what, uh, what they're doing. And, you know, you're talking about it in that way. And, and I just feel like, you know, this is something that we be, need to be very careful about how we talk about uh, some of the, some of our father's mistakes. To, um, you know, expose your father in that way is, is, is kind of like to expose his vulnerabilities and weaknesses. One thing that was interesting, I was reading about the Moravians and, and um, uh, many of you who know a little bit about that, you know, Zinzendorf was uh, one of the leaders of the Moravians and he was, um, you know, highly esteemed among them. But he also had some pretty significant flaws and many of those were not, did not come out till much later. But when Zinzendorf died, um, there was a kind of his right hand man, one of his best leaders that he was he worked with. Um, uh, now I can't remember his name, but anyway, he took it upon himself to write an account of Zinzendorf's life, and which was typical Moravian style. They they cast a lot to see if he should also write about the 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 um, the bad part of his his uh, personality and as well as the good part. And a lot came out and said no. And so they decided that he's not going to write about that. So he's, he kept it somewhat neutral, but he did not talk about all the, the, the flaws in um, Zinzendorf's character. And, you know, I thought about that and I, I, I'm not sure, you know, to what extent you take that. But if you think about it, for him to, to, to put, that, put out that writing, it could have actually destabilized the whole society that they, that the thing that God had already done with them. And um, so I, I think that maybe that was very wise and that was the right thing to do in that situation. But anyway, so what is the right way to do it? Um, so Shem and, and Japheth, you know what they, they actually did something about their father's nakedness, his flaws, his vulnerabilities. But in the process of taking care of it, they chose not to see it, not to talk about it and basically turn their back on their father's weaknesses. But the point is, they actually did something about it. Um, but they tried to hide their father's sins. And again, I don't know to what extent you take this. I think there's, there's certainly, certainly limits to that. But um, I think the idea here, what you get out of this is, you know, when you see the judgments that came upon them, um, ultimately, if you want to expose your father's weaknesses or his vulnerabilities, um, in this case, your children end up becoming are being the ones that become slaves. And, you know, I, I really think that that has, you know, how many of, of um, people coming out of a religious system, you know, whether it's the Amish or anything else that... Um, uh, have not walked that carefully and you look at the next generation and what happens with them and I just think that uh, uh, it seems like that very thing plays out right in front of their eyes and even in American society today you see the slavery that people get into and all kinds of things um, so yeah just uh, to be careful how we respond to those things. And in the process of, yes, make corrections. Yes, do something about it. Uh, make changes for the next generation that are positive and, and, and improvements. And um, there's a whole other thing that, other uh, part of that that I could share about some of, the, some of the things that are actually happening within the Amish and some of the people that I know that are still Amish and actually are making positive changes there um, and are choosing to be there and to be honorable in the process and uh, actually making some some progress in those kind of things but yeah just to be very careful how we how we relate to those things from our fathers um it looks like my time is about up i was going to share just a little bit of a testimony maybe i'll just go quick over that real quick here i have um about 10 or 12 years ago i there was a young man here locally that uh, actually a son of one of my cousins that wanted to leave the Amish. He wanted to um, uh, buy a car and he wanted to go to another church. And, and it seemed like the Lord had done something in his heart. He was um, had gotten converted and, and wanted to serve the Lord. But um, 
yeah, was maybe a little misguided in some of his things. And his dad then hid his um, hid his um, birth certificate so that he couldn't get a driver's license and some things like that. And somehow I heard a little bit about this. Also, the other thing is dad was pressuring him to to um, join the church, which uh, his, when the, most of you probably know where the Amish, you have it every other year. You have the instructions classes and then you you get baptized into the church. Well, that had just passed for them. So he had another year and a half, but his father was already pressuring him saying that he needs to join the church. I heard about this. And so I, so I, so I reached out to him and I told him that uh, um, he, before he does any of anything against his parents, he should stop in sometime. I want to talk to him. And so he did stopped in one, his, one Sunday afternoon on his way to the youth event and, and um, talked to him for about 45 minutes and just really going through some of the things that I shared here today. And, just the importance of, um, of uh, honoring parents. And he took that seriously and he went, well, what I told him, I said, you know, there's no sin for you to drive your house horse and buggy. There's no sin for you to wear the, the, the clothes that your mom wants you to wear. And uh, as far as joining the church, you have a year and a half to deal with that. You don't have to worry about that anytime soon. You go back and you, you obey your parents and you honor them the best that you can. He took that seriously, he went back. And uh, I think it was within about six months or so he was actually, he had a car. He was getting baptized in another church, all with his parents' blessings. And his parents were um, driving with him. And um, his father said to somebody else, he says, that, that young man's name was Joe. And he said uh, to somebody, somebody else that I know then, he said, I don't know what happened to Joe, but whatever Joe has, I want it. Just this last summer, um, Joe's mom died, which would have been my cousin. And so I went to the viewing and we went through and then we were walking out, getting ready to leave. And Joe comes running after me, he yells after me, he says, hey, I want to talk to you. And he says, um, you know, I just want to really thank you for what you did back then, that it was because of that, that my parents got saved. And so anyway, I'm going to end with that testimony and uh, turn it over to the moderator again. All right. Thank you so much. Brother Steve, for sharing these things. Uh, by the way, for those of you that are listening in, we enjoy hearing from you. If uh, after a bit when I'm done here, if there's anybody that has any comments, questions, a little bit of a personal testimony, we'd be happy to hear from you. I will say that I wish I would have heard this 15 years ago. It's 15 and a half years uh, something like that since my wife and I got saved and ended up leaving the Amish church and all that. And there's definitely regrets I have of how I handled certain things back there and lack of honor that I displayed in a number of ways that could have been different. Um, but I can't go back and redo it. Um, but I, I, I do appreciate the, um, just appreciate the teaching this morning. The one thing that really stood out to me, uh, let me see here. Maybe this is better. Um, Brother Steve mentioned that we often don't appreciate the social structure around us because we don't realize what we're being saved from. That's so true. Ecclesiastes 7.10, it says, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. I think it's so easy to not appreciate the battles that the generation before us has fought, partly because we weren't there, and partly because looking back, it looks like those battles were so much easier. And the reason being, we now stand after the fact, and we look back, and we know how things have ended up. Therefore, it, it, it doesn't look as complicated as it did in the moment. So just to learn to appreciate the, um, the battles that the generation before had, had to face, and in the middle of it, it was complicated, it was difficult, they didn't know how it was going to end up. They probably tried their best, and now we are here. We're called to stand. We're called to fight the good fight of faith. 
definitely just appreciate the uh, way things were given this morning. I feel like it was well balanced. We need to honor, and yet at the same time, we need to put our hands to the plow, look to God, seek his kingdom, and go forward in that way. So is there anybody that would like to say anything here? Just uh, make sure you're unmuted and go ahead. Well, good morning, Brother Steve. It's a real blessing to listen to your teaching here this morning. Um, yeah, some real wisdom that you shared with us for the younger generation. Um, um, yeah, you mentioned about the older generation brings a lot of stability. I really agree with that. Actually, in my years in my youth, um, I struggled with relating to other youth boys. Instead, I would talk to the older men a lot. I just felt like they're a lot more stable. Um, there's a lot more care there. A lot of the youth boys, I thought, seemed rather immature and silly kind of thing. So, um, but when when you talk to older people, you 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 tend to they tend to be full of wisdom. There's a lot they've learned. You, you you made the comment, I wrote it down on my tablet here. If you want to live long, talk to those who have lived long. Um, there's a lot of a lot of truth to that. And there's a lot of mistakes that older people have made. And they can give us wisdom in avoiding the same mistakes they have made. So thank you very much and really appreciate it. And God bless you. Thank you, Brother Elam. I would echo that as well. Anyone else that would like to say anything? We'd love to hear from you. Yes, uh, Brother Steve, I appreciate what you shared. Um, I was wondering if you'd want to share some stories how it went with you after you became convicted of honoring your father? Yes, um, there, there is, um, there's a lot I could share there. That was quite a journey. Um, uh, one of the, one of the maybe more special moments was, um, I mean, what happened after that was it was kind of a kind of a process, but you know, it took a little time. But um, uh, I know that I, like I said, I practiced that trying to ask my father um, questions that I had that I felt like he'd have some wisdom for me, and and um, little by little it began to open up where you know we were welcome at their home. One of the things that happened is the first time that we they'd put a lot of pressure on us. Uh, I don't say a lot of pressure, but they'd put some pressure on us to try to stay Amish. They were trying to hoping that it would work out and they kind of understood. And yet they um, trying to help us, you know, that we could. Well, when we finally left and I didn't drive for about nine months or something like that after we left. And I just, uh, and partly because of that relationship with my, my parents, I just, I just, that had been really growing. I just didn't put it, want to put any kind of, um, obstacles in in that, but when we when we first finally started driving, and um, I remember the first time that we were, we went to my parents' house and visited, we were driving a van and we weren't dressed Amish anymore, and um, had a really nice visit. And on the way out, my my mom comes up to my wife and she gives her a big hug, and she said that um, sorry that we put so much pressure on you. We love you just the way you are. And that really was very meaningful to us. And then also, um, I remember different times that dad and I, dad did some work for me over the years. Um, I set up, you know, a drill press and some things there in his shop where he could do work that, um, that I was getting for here. And um, so in those times, I got time to just spend some time talking sometimes. And I remember one time that uh, he just kind of, with tears in his eyes, just apologized for, you know, not being there for us always when we were growing up and just had a really sweet time of, of, and then I, you know, was able to apologize for my 
own sins and those kind of things. There was just moments like that throughout that time. And little by little, things kind of opened up to where when we were, we would go to visit them, you know, dad would be one of the first ones to go grab a Bible and say, you know, I wonder what it says about this and, and, and that or something else or whatever. And just really ended up being a very sweet time, different times over that, uh, that whole process where um, just felt like, by the end, there was just total healing in our relationship. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you. Well, that's really powerful. I just really appreciate that testimony and desire to learn from it. And hopefully we can all learn from that and just approach life in a balanced, godly way, doing things God's way and let him work out the details. Is there anyone else that would like to share anything? Feel free. Again, just really, really appreciate it. The talk this morning, I believe God will use it. And just thank everyone for coming on. May you all have a blessed day in the Lord. Brother Steve, would you close us in prayer, please? Sure. Father, we just thank you for your goodness and for the word that you give to us, Lord, to guide our hearts, our lives, uh, that it's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, Lord, that we can walk in your ways. And we just thank you, Father, for the many promises and the way that you do bless those who who walk in, in um, your commandments, Father. And I just want to ask, Lord, that this word could go out and could be a blessing to many, that we could learn how to honor one another, how to honor the older generation, how to honor our parents, and, and really create a culture of honor. And Father, I just want to pray that um, um, you would give grace to the hearers to, to understand and to receive um, what is of you, Lord, and of your word, and, and to put it into practice in their life, Lord. I just pray your blessing on all of those who have put efforts into making this possible um, and uh, the technical details that go into that, Lord, I just pray, pray that you would pour out a blessing on them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Guide me.